Hi again, everyone. I'm Ollie Matthews. This is the Narcissistic Resistance, and this resistance video is sponsored by contribution from Lori, and here's her story. Hi, Ollie. I'm Lori. I've been enjoying your videos for the past several months. A lot of my family behavior now makes sense. Here's my story. A few years ago, my father's health started rapidly going downhill. It was all my mother could do to take care of them, so she asked me to take over their finances. There were unopened bills all over the house, which was a hoarder's nightmare, scam charges on the credit cards, and there were spending more than their income. I put the bills and deposits on auto pay, started paying down their debts with their income, got the bogus charges off the credit cards, and put the credit card debt on an interest-free card. My sister-in-law, who along with my brother can barely pay their own bills, even though they are retired from decades at the post office, took my mother to the bank to move the money to a new account. I took my mom to the bank to have it switched back and had to redo all the auto pays. Sister-in-law and brother went to the bank to have it switched back again and hustled her to a lawyer to have power of attorney switched over to her on a day when she was out of her thyroid medication. My mother went along with it all like a bump on a log. No, she doesn't have dementia. After my father died, I called an estate sale company who said my mom could make four to 5000 on the sale. My mom had to stay with me while they were working, and while she was at my house, sister-in-law accused me of stealing from and starving my mother. A social worker from the county came out to see if there was food, and of course there was, and I had to spend hours submitting paperwork showing all the checks to me were legitimate reimbursements. The county found no basis for the complaint. My phone bill showed dozens of calls to sister-in-law over the, the two weeks mom stayed with me. I know my mother had to be bitching to my sister-in-law that she was short of money. Of course, you'll feel short of money when you've been on a spending spree, and now you're whittling down debt, and that I didn't have the food she wanted. We both require a low-carb diet, therefore I didn't have chips and cereal in the house, which she loves to eat. So my mom put my brother in charge of her finances and the bills didn't get paid. After all this, mom wanted me to run her finances again. Are you insane? My first instinct was self-preservation. Stay out of trouble with the law. I said, you're going to have to find someone else to do this for you. I'd happy to be take care of her finances and protect her from relatives hustling her for money, but I can't do it without her help. She's been hustled out of at least 13000 by relatives, and that's just what I know about. She thinks I'm richer than God, but when in reality I can't afford a nursing home for her if she runs out of money. I've told her this. It's Medicaid banner if she, run, if she outlives her money. <clears throat> The estate sale was a bust. Mom pulled so many things out of the sale that she didn't make any money. She blames me for losing everything in that sale, even though she signed the paperwork and my sister and niece stole $3,000 worth of stuff out of the garage. Mom accused her assistant of the theft, even though my, niece, my, sister, and, my sister and niece stole stuff from the house before they rented a moving truck the same, same day the stuff was stolen. Meanwhile, at work, my boss, whom I'll, whom I'll call Frick, liked to talk down to me and others who reported to her. All she did was run around to meetings and annoy us. She was originally hired as the manager's, managing partner's assistant, but even though she had no industry experience and I think no supervisory experience, was made senior operations manager and supervised both staff and managers. The managing partner didn't even tell the office manager that she wasn't our supervisor anymore. I've worked at a few places where a random friend of the boss was put in charge of something and it never works. Frick loved to run around the office giving orders, even though she had no idea what anybody did. Gossip, break into people's conversations, suck up to the partners and talk to the rest of us like we didn't know anything. She liked to humiliate and insult us too. Give, to give a mild example, she gave me a gift card for some occasion for some occasion to a restaurant at the other end of downtown and said, I don't know if there's anything you can eat there. That was her normal everyday demeanor towards us. She was as arrogant as she was incompetent. She couldn't even keep track of whether the phones were covered and couldn't manage her own household. Details in a moment. She was one of us. She, the only one of us she got along with was a suck-up I'll call frack. 
Frick and Frack one day had a long conversation about their visits to the gynecologist in the cubicle next to mine. This was during regular business hours when they had when they had to have known I was sitting there trying to work. Frack talked about having her father photograph her childbirth. Ugh. At that point, I had to get up and leave to keep my coffee down. What ha when it happened again, I complained to HR and it stopped. Frick acted like nothing happened. Frack sulked away and would say on the phone sometimes in the next cube, I can't talk about that because of who's here. I guess that was supposed to make me feel bad. I thought it just made her look like a dipshit. It was a professional office and she acted like it was she was in a biker bar. Frick and the managing partner also let Frack send out cheeky office-wide emails about logging time, saying if you didn't complete your timesheet, you'd be charged PTO, and it was irrevocable. When Frack tried to cheat me out of an hour's PTO over this, I emailed the head of HR for the whole firm and included Frack's messages. After that, Frack wouldn't look at me. Her office-wide emails got a lot more professional, though with no nasty note about PTO being irreversible. A year after my dad died, I got the idea to sell my house and get a better deal somewhere less expensive. My mom said she didn't think she'd want to go on without me, but later said she'd like to move back to where she grew up. If she could move, so could, if she could move, so could I. A few months later, I decamped to Indiana. There's nothing in Indiana. I have friends in Indiana. There's not much there. <clears throat> I worked on a part-time temporary basis for the firm's office there. I had a pleasant female supervisor whom I worked with remotely and didn't have any problems. <clears throat> My next job was supposed to be admin, IT, and social media, but it turned out to be collections in a dumpy office. That lasted one day. I had fuck you money, and I, didn't, and I didn't have to put up with that. I tempted for the county. I tempted, I tempted for the county for a while, then went to work at an art department. I hadn't met my supervisor before starting, and her matter made it clear she didn't like me. I asked for a box of tissues, and she snapped, we don't have any. God, sorry I asked. Most people on the team were disconnected in some way books on tape, Xanax, or working on a different floor or a different shift. For, for the level of difficulty and stress, the job wasn't worth the money. I planned to study database programming in my spare time while working there, but the stress and environment sapped too much of my energy. I started looking for a new job after a particularly bad day. I soon landed a job with a competitor of my old firm. They're, they're a... <clears throat> Best employer as voted by employees in most of the states they're in. I'm very happy there. At the old firm, I was doing the work of two people. They hired two people to replace me, dealing with frickin' frack on top of dealing with asshole relatives. I came home every night and fell on the bed in exhaustion. At my new job, I really like my boss and coworkers, and the work is more interesting than it was at the old firm. They appreciate my contributions. Moving was a life upgrade in so many ways. A better house, better job, more money, and I'm away from all the bullshit. It wasn't easy. It was a thousand mile move. But I bought a second house before I sold the first. But I was selling in a hot market. I had no permanent job lined up. I did a lot, and I mean a lot, of research before. I, I did a lot, and I mean a lot, of research beforehand. But I, but I still had sleepless nights. I don't know where I found the energy to get my house ready to sell. I was exhausted from work and suffering side effects from a medication that took me over a year to get over. I ran on adrenaline, I suppose. I had a lot of scary heart palpitations, but I did it. Where are they now? <clears throat> Mom's still around, she, even though I moved. She's still going through boxes she had for 40 years. We still talk, and it's okay. I don't handle her money. Dad still taking a dirt nap. Sister-in-law, she just hustled mom for 500 for car repairs. We're no contact and I'm not on Facebook. Frickin' Frack, I don't know about Frack, but shortly before I left, Frick's husband died and she sent out two office-wide emails begging for money to have her lawn mowed, her house clean, and meals brought to her and her kids, even though we're the same age. 
I was on the brink of owning a house free and clear with money to spare and she was begging for money. That and the fact that someone she supervises is now happily married to a wonderful man, man must really gall her. With her buddy, the managing partner, leaving the work at another office, we'll see how well she does with no ability to run anything but her mouth. I'm not over being angry at the way my coworkers and I were treated. Me, I'm finally well after a year. Well, I'm finally well after a year and a half. The palpitations have been gone for a few months, and I can eat normally again. In my hometown, I haven't been back. The only way I want to see it is from thirty thousand feet. Best regards. Hope you are well. Thanks for all you do, Lori. Well, <clears throat> not much I could say as much as far as <clears throat> analysis. Um, on that you know but there's a lesson to be learned you know nothing is going to change until you leave until you leave your situation and this is Lori someone who even though she's dealt with a lot of nonsense a lot of blame shifting is smart enough to get up and change get up and move get up and move and get up and move and the final line is is probably the best don't go back. Like, I have no intention. I don't want to see it. I don't miss it. Nothing is going to change until you leave, and I've said that before. So, thank you for your story and your contribution, Lori. Uh, I hope this helps. Thank you to everybody watching. Please leave any opinions or advice in the comments section below. And again, if you want your story read on the channel, you have a topic you'd like me to cover, a narcissist you'd like to expose, you'd like to set up a Skype chat, phone call, have a private video made, or a Facebook chat, or you'd like to sponsor a video for someone else, or just sponsor the channel in general, you know what to do with the PayPal and email links in the description box. And if you're still unclear, wait for the instructional video link to pop up at the end of this video to walk you through all of that. Please like and share this video wherever you can. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't. And be sure to click the subscription bell to be notified of all my video uploads. I'm Ollie Matthews. This has been The Narcissistic Resistance.